Hi folks and welcome to the Irish Wrestling Podcast with this special edition where we're going to be reviewing AEW All In from London. Um, joining me today, Mark, who I got to spend a lot of time with in London. Um, we had a bit of crack over there um, and we'll be going through what we did on the day. Um, Mark, how's things? I haven't seen you in about a week. Tremendous, yeah, flying it. Absolutely flying it. Enjoying the good weather here, as, uh, we, as you touched on there. We... Uh, spend a bit too much time with each other's company over in London that's why we've given this a couple of weeks to kind of breathe and get uh, reacclimatized to stop being sick of each other uh, before reviewing this show but yeah no listen all good hope everything's uh, doing well this, your way and you're enjoying the good weather too yeah yeah good um, there was that bit of a, a hangover if if that makes sense coming off the back of, of what was a, a pretty hectic um, what, what I thought was going to be four days which turned into nearly a week um, due to due to flight issues um, but yeah, a bit, a bit of a hangover off the back of that. But um, yeah, doing good. But um, yeah, we'll we'll dive straight in to, to all in. Mark, give give us the overview. What was your overview of the the entire show, the entire day? Um, it was a bit different for you as well because you did do a bit of media afterwards. So pretty pretty new to you as well on that side. So give give us our overview of the day. Yeah, like, I absolutely loved it in terms of the actual day itself, the actual spectacle. Like, I've been fortunate enough to be, I was at WWE Clash of the Castle last year, I was at WWE WrestleMania last year as well, and this was entirely different. It had a very different atmosphere, a very different energy. It was people who were genuinely excited for what they're about to see in the ring, people who were actually excited for not just a spectacle or people who, it was also people who appreciate what they're about to see in terms of wrestling uh, and the performance they're about to see. We go to WWE shows, people are more generally excited for, by and large, the entrances and the fireworks and that kind of thing, that respect. They're not actually there to watch wrestling. They're there yeah. for the big show atmosphere and they think they're involved. People get more excited to hear, sing along with some of these music than they do appreciating the story that's being told by wrestlers. So this is absolutely brilliant. Um, I think... I said to you at the time, it was the best overall spectacle I'd ever seen in my life. Um, in terms of the day, listen, the networking opportunities being like in the queuing with people you listen to on a daily basis, walking in the media queue, be it the, the figure four wrestling observer online guys, what culture guys, um, people from mainstream media, be it like balls.ie, daily mail and stuff, networking with those guys. So it was brilliant, really, really good day overall. Um, I was like four rows in the front as well. I was fortunate enough to be really, really good seats. So it felt like very much you're in the eye of the storm. And about halfway through the show, I kind of reflected, geez, I'm literally in the center circle of Wembley Stadium here now. I'm looking around. Do you know what I mean? Like it's that kind of novelty. You look around, you see the stadium. It's just lit up. Uh, fireworks going off overhead. You felt very much like you're in the eye of the storm. Um, I can't put into words how good that atmosphere was at the time. Um, yeah, it's something to live with with me forever and hopefully uh be in a similar situation next year yeah um just because it was in a stadium as well i think that's something maybe we, we can address um your experience would have been very different to my experience based on just how how vast the stadium is and the people that you have around you like with you you were obviously a lot closer than i was so you were probably closer to the action probably more felt like that you were actually at a wrestling show where for me i'm a bit further back i had a, a boom camera coming across the yeah. front of me every now and again so a lot of times i'm looking up at the screen and um, so for me it was more I, I was kind of taken out of the the wrestling side of things a little mm. bit i didn't feel like i was as engrossed in the action but yeah. more that the spectacle of everything the lights the production the fireworks the music everything it just felt like the, the electricity of the whole event from start to finish kind of kept me in it um, and I don't think I, I think once you're sitting outside that, that kind of floor range I think I, in my opinion I don't think it matters where you sit to be quite honest like mm. like I, I, I sat in, in the lower the lower tiers I think based on the, the same experience I think I'd have been happy sitting up the back as well like you know once you're outside of that and it wasn't a bad experience at all it was great it was amazing to see um, but yeah there was definitely my experience and your experience of the show would have been yeah. vastly different based on that. Um, no, it's completely. I, when I was at WrestleMania last year, I was in a kind of similar type of seat to you, around that lower bowl, mm. kind of facing directly in the ring. Um, but I, I think I did appreciate that the WWE or so the AEW show wasn't overly produced. You didn't mm. have fucking strobe lights going off every yeah, ten yeah. seconds. You didn't. You didn't have hundreds of screens and hundreds of lights everywhere taken away from what's in front of you so yeah. like when i was at the wwe wrestlemania 38 in dallas like i swear to god i don't know how i didn't develop epilepsy like there was certain points like after during each show 
me and my friend who were over at the time on both days thought like, I, I feel completely out of this there's just too much sensory stuff going on yeah, yeah. both of us getting headaches and by the time you leave the venue it takes you a while to kind of come down or just for your vision to kind of recalibrate and just, like everything to feel like you're not frazzled um i think that having the same setup in Wembley as you would for a concert, the same you would for boxing fights, kind of the big screens in the middle, big screens either end, people are able to sit back and relax a bit more and take it in almost as if like you're, if you are a bit further removed, it'd be more similar to being um, maybe at a movie theater watching a show um, or perhaps like in a, if you're watching the World Rumble in Ireland that you used to do watching it in a bar, you're still surrounded by a great bunch of people and you still have the atmosphere of a live event. Um, so I don't completely understand that. Like the, Clash of the Castle was probably similar in that sense, um, despite being a dire show. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I completely, I completely do get that. But yeah, hundred percent. If you're not quite in the eye of the storm, I do appreciate it is a very different experience. Yeah. Yeah, like it, it does. Like the the people around you definitely make it, and and you can kind of tell with some of the chants that were going, like you you might start chanting something over this side, and it might travel around your section or the sections beside you, but it. I don't think I don't think any chant outside of people maybe singing entrance songs or something that was really obvious. I don't think anything kinda of travelled the full length of the stadium and everyone got up in one voice. and mm. um, because it's just it like you need to be chanting for ten minutes by the time it travels around, you know. So you can have the crack with the people around you, which which we had we seem to have a very good group around us. Um, and everyone just seemed to be in great spirits, just like you could feel the buzz. I I felt the buzz outside now about an hour before the show. You could feel it coming into it, and you could feel the excitement starting to build up and build up, and you you start to realize once like we were there since early. So like I walked down Olympic Way up to Wembley Stadium at I think it was eight o'clock that morning when we we met for breakfast, um and the place was deserted. You know there was a few uh, vendors starting to put out stalls, and it, it just felt like any other day. You know and then come two o'clock maybe three o'clock you could start to see the people coming in the place was packed and you could start to feel the electricity in the air and and the buzz starting to build um but let's let's look at the show um you did say to me it was probably the best show you've ever ever been to um mm. live um the dean rim product didn't disappoint either although it was a spectacle they didn't necessarily have to put on a mega show um in ring wires but they still did and they still managed to to hit it out of the park with that there's, there's a lot of matches to go through but um what were what were the standouts for you mark yeah like i, I said there it wasn't necessarily the spectacle and a lot of us uh, in this part of the world would have probably felt um quite neglected based on the kind of build for a lot of the aw shows like i was chatting to a few of the what culture guys um in person and uh over a call a few weeks prior and the idea was like around AEW all in. It felt like the, the, the spectacle was a bigger thing than the, the card itself and there wasn't that much care or effort put into it. That was the perception. Um, and it felt like it was almost going to be like another token gesture WWE mm -hmm. show. Oh, no, but you can come to see the stars. These are the American yeah. TV stars you get to see without the appreciation that we're wrestling fans who've been staying up till 5 o'clock in the morning for 20, 30 years. Um, whereas the like, WWE house shows and like, your favorite stars are here yeah but like yeah. they couldn't give a shit like they're here this is just another day of the week for them like they could they're going to do a house show match regardless of it's money in the bank or whatever um or a clash of the castle that was god awful sorry i've said that again but um yeah that was the kind of anticipation going into it and then in the weeks kind of prior you kind of realize oh no there's actually a reason going into this the way the card's been laid out they've only got three heavy singles matches mm -hmm. they've got a couple of other Kind of stipulation matches be it like the stadium stampede again for that stadium spectacle to have a different feel and a way of pacing a card throughout so it's not just that we were at the rev pro copper box show the night before mm -hmm. and that was very heavy on singles matches and it yeah. felt like one after the other after the other and each of them lose their effect and you don't know which is supposed to be valued more internally like the rev pro heavyweight championship was the semi-main which then took from the main event which also felt like any show matches typically in a semi-main spot is supposed to be kind of a secondary match as mm -hmm. it was in the all-in cards so yeah. Um, for me, the actual card, it's, the actual matches itself, um, there were three standouts for various different reasons. I think for me as a massive fan, I think the FTR Young Bucks match, that was because it had a very unique feel. It felt like the only match where people really cared about which side won. It felt like, almost like during Conor McGregor was at the peak back in 2014, 15, 16, like you really didn't want him to lose. Mm -hmm. 
was the main thing. You were like, you really, oh shit, we can't lose. Oh fuck, fuck, fuck. When he's fighting Ch Chad Mendes, like for me, it felt like, oh shit, the, the FTR are gonna lose here. And I, it was the same with a lot of the Young Bucks fans around me. People really dividing their team, not losing as much as anything. The second one that stood out to me was the opener, CM Punk and Samoa Joe, just for the Carney, Cena kind of vibes going into it and the kind of pantomime atmosphere and the way the two veteran performers kind of played into it. They didn't need to do a hundred different spots. They're able to soak up the atmosphere and I'd say they've called very, very little of that match prior. Um, and then the third one that stood out to me was Jericho Will Ospreay. Um, just purely for the spectacle of both entrances, Jericho obviously had his tie back to um, Queen at Live Aid doing the hey, oh, entrance then doing a live rendition of Judas where full 81,000 people are singing along and then a 7.15 minute match or so that exceeded everybody's expectations like there were so many different things you could talk about a lot of people will talk about Stadium Stampede a lot of people will talk about the main event and the real I suppose melodrama that was but I didn't give it, I didn't that wasn't one of my highlights as fantastic as it was um, another highlight I'd probably touch on would be uh Sting's entrance music where he got his WCW yeah. uh, Metallica theme back like, I'd say 99% of that crowd hadn't a clue the significance of it it's always oh, got a new music there was, there was the a few, there was a few dotted pops around me but yeah. you could definitely see a few people probably didn't get the reference like, no, like it, it, and I was just losing my mind at the, again at the centre of the storm and no, no, like all these kind of farm people around me were like oh, this could be cool uh. yeah. okay well this is fucking WCW's thing this is unbelievable um Oh, there's other, other really special moments where you got to see, like, uh, Soraya coming out to Queen with the, her Knight family, be it Zach Zodiac, RKJ, and others coming into the ring. Um, yeah, there's so many different things in that show, and it was absolutely brilliant. I thought it was just the way it was structured. There was no... You didn't need to compare anything with anything else in the show. You can just enjoy each match for their unique element that they had. And there was no real low or dull moment in it for me. Um... Having said, I, I, it's funny. This is a really funny thing to say. I say the low moment in the whole show was the second match. It was the Kenny Omega, Kota Ibushi, Hangman Page versus Kanosuke Takeshita, Bullet Club Gold, Jay White, and Juice Robinson. List those six people and the fact that's the low moment of the show. That's mm -hmm. mad uh, in terms of like quality and engagement and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. I loved every minute of it. Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, you, you definitely hit the nail on the head with, with a lot of the, the, the solid points there. Um, yeah, for me, like the the tag match was a spectacle in itself. It was, it was great to, to be able to see something like that. Um, for me, like that's that's the biggest tag match in the world, and um, probably for most people as well. And to be able to to sit there and watch that, um, and to to just be privileged to be there when that match was taking place, like, um, regardless of how it went or who won or for me, it wasn't. I wasn't cheering on one side over the other. You get me? Like it, it really didn't matter to me who who really won that match. Um, the main event, it, a spectacle in the lead up to it. Uh, everyone anticipating who's gonna turn on who, which I think was the the team that was drawn out. Um, but then yeah, you get you get moments like um, Sting's entrance, House of Black entrance, where the lights go, and everyone has the the phone lights out, and you can just see the fireflies around. Wembley and it's it's just stuff like that is just mesmerizing um for a bit of a down point for me was probably and, and I enjoyed the match but stadium stampede I think kind of missed the bar a bit for me in terms of a stadium stampede um I don't think they utilized the stadium as much as I anticipated they would just for just to, to kind of reference that like so the they used the, the entrance ramp in around that area and then they kind of went up into the the executive boxes up kind of where people would lift the trophy in Wembley up around that area. There was two cameras actually moved. I was on the other side of the pitch at the from the entrance and there was two cameras actually moved into place on that side of the pitch before the match started. So to me, anticipating that they could like work their way around the stadium they didn't they very much stuck to that one area of the stadium which i think the, the match was very enjoyable but for a stadium stampede i thought it was going to go with so many people involved i literally thought that like there was going to be two people fighting over here then another two over there and another two over there and i really thought that they were going to like branch right out where they didn't they kind of stuck to just the ring and the main section the one positive though that um, I was talking to someone about is they always made sure that there was someone or some sort of action in the ring which I think is massive because 
there's so many people in the venue that they don't want to be sitting there watching the screen so at least there's something in the ring to be watching at all times so i thought that was that was very good because you've, you've seen in other cases or in other matches wwe have done it before where you have hardcore matches or whatever and they go into the back and then people in the, the arena are sitting there watching the screens waiting for them to come back out you there was never that moment there was always something taking place you know um so just for me that was the that was the only kind of downside um that and probably the the, the women's match was very quick probably a bit too quick considering there was four women in the match and um, i think they, they could have done a lot more with the match they could have potentially given them a bit more time um, and drawn that out a bit more Um, i just thought that that was very quick but but aside from that like and both matches were still good matches you know so that's that's how how high the bar was on that for me um but uh obviously the the, the show didn't go without controversy um which is a, a, a very big shame because everyone should be singing from the rooftops about the the show that was put on by AEW but unfortunately that wasn't the the, the news stories coming out um we kind of got wind of it just around the start of the show that there was an incident that took place backstage um between CM Punk and Jack Perry um which we know developed a bit further throughout the day that there was um, there there was punches thrown. There was it, it turned out Jack Perry got got put into a, a sleeper hole or a Kamara or whatever it was, um, and then they got broken up. There was uh, Samoa Joe trying to get CM Punk to go back out to the match as of a minute before the match actually started or before they did their entrances. They didn't actually know if the match was going going ahead or not or or what match they were going to put on in place and things were being moved around backstage supposedly. Um, there was supposedly threats made towards Tony Khan again um a lot of stuff coming out on that mark i know we both kind of sit on different sides of the fence on this and we have spoken about it and mm -hmm. we, we do kind of tend to like like see different views on things but i think we're friendly enough about talking about it you know but um what what were your views on on what kind of took place um, yeah, and the fallout that, with that like i suppose there's like three or four different elements and like the, the, the consistent factor across all of them is cm punk to be fair and like i think it was an untenable situation in the end uh, and yeah, regardless of what you think, like at the end, he had to be had to be a party of ways. Ultimately, regardless of who you favour over what side or the other, I think he did have to move on or at least just go away for a while um, until there's at a high level as some sort of control exercise over the company more than anything uh, and there's proper structures put in place where people are in power. Um, now I've got to be careful what I say because I've put out three or four stories to different people that have gone fairly viral over the past couple of weeks um there's one or two that are going to be going out today so i might as well crack into a few of them here because i think a few of them have already gone viral um so cm punk was at uh, a w collision on the wednesday in atlanta the there was a mediator put in place over the coming weeks to try to get a number of issues involved involving cm punk resolved um that was brian danielson so Brian Danielson set up a meeting with CM Punk or attempted to with CM Punk and the Young Bucks in Atlanta. Uh, CM Punk was told the meeting was going ahead and when he got to Atlanta he was told the meeting was cancelled. And then the Young Bucks had put out a statement saying no, 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 we never agreed to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Fair enough, that's he said, she said. That, yeah. that is what, this is one person's perspective on what he's been told. Okay. Mm -hmm. Following that, he set up flying on the Thursday or the Friday like a lot of people did to uh, London and to avoid trouble as much as anything uh, even though he ultimately got himself in a lot of trouble he didn't want to stay around people for too long in London and keep negativity and press to a minimum he flew over on the Sunday or Saturday night Sunday morning arrived right. into London there's been contradicting stories in this so every AEW talent that flew over on the Thursday or Friday were told they would be collected in waves if you're a production staff you'd be collected by bus from Heathrow Airport over to your hotel either the Nova Hotel or the Hilton in Wembley if you're a certain talent on a different flight you were given the number of an Uber driver that would collect you at your gate or outside and those those for the certain few days CM Punk was given a separate um, contact and number to be collected and he was sure they'd be picked up by his gate in the Heathrow airport on the Sunday. Uh, he arrived and there's nobody there. He was then he contacted the number, couldn't get through. Now that could be just an American not knowing what 0044 yeah, is. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, there's a bit of that That's, that's, anyway. what, that's what he probably said straight away. Did he put in yeah, 0044? Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, but then he also then contacted the AW Travel Department, which is uh, are the, the AW Travel Department is 
between a few different referees, I won't name names, and a couple of guys who play doubles for the Young Bucks on BT. Just, you can make it that way you will, that's a fact. Um, he then, they said, well, if you can't get through to him, you should make your own way to the hotel. He said, fine. From Heathrow to Wembley, you'd be in a car for well over an hour and a half. And it, uh, if you go on Google Maps, it's actually quicker to go by train. Mm -hmm. So that's what he did. And then, given that you're using roaming data, it's much more our, neg our issues when we were, say, progress, we couldn't get any data at all. Yeah. If you're using roaming data within the United Kingdom, your maps aren't going to be the best. So when you're on, and particularly when you're on the underground, you get no service at all. So yeah. he's there trying to navigate all these different systems. And there's a, good, a guy called At The Berg, uh, a guy I, I know from the Qatari wrestling scene. Um, him and his mates met CM Punk, this poor, disheveled, jet-lagged man who's obviously got anger issues, um, really struggling to find his way. And they just went up to him and asked him, can we give you a hand? Because we're going to Wembley. Do you want a hand to get into it? Yeah, he would. So they helped him get to, to Wembley. He was uh, he relayed all that story to them. Got him to his hotel. So that was one of the stories I put out there this week. Um, following that, then he went to Wembley. Um, there's a couple of contradicting timelines in this. But this is what I know anyway. Um, he's by and large he was fine. He actually met with the young bucks on the Sunday uh, at Wembley uh, around the ringside. He actually had a nice engagement with them there were there's a point where they're all rehearsing around the ring and given that he turned up slightly late everybody's like oh shit okay here we go oh, and yeah. he walked by them stuck his hand out and said let's make history the bush shook hands and he walked away that was it um so there was nothing on that front mm -hmm. he as jericho um outlined in his podcast while punk was talking to joe by ringside he went up to him and said hey are you doing a frankenstein i said no i'm not doing a frankenstein i'm actually cool and then uh, punk said, and then jericho said i'm gonna do a gts <laughs> and waited for punk to to kind of cop that he was messing. Yeah. Uh, they had a nice interaction. That was that. Following that, then the story is that he kind of he had a couple of small arguments around travel and other bits and pieces uh, with Tony Khan. Obviously, just there's obviously a huge amount of background issues that we're not fully privy to, yeah. and what what we are privy to is one side of a, a, an argument. Um, from there, um, what I know, because uh, I was there, we're in the queue for getting into the media entrance one of the people i was standing with he's a prominent media member he was getting phone calls from jack perry and another person in jack perry's camp um essentially letting him know that something bad is going to happen in jack perry's match and then something that and then this person got off the phone and he said oh my effing god why can't tony Khan control his effing talents this shouldn't be happening and i assume he kind of let me know it was going to do something with a finish Mm -hmm. which wasn't a finish but so jack perry had essentially spent the whole week having been on the same show and segment he was actually in the same segment of the main event of AEW collision on the saturday with this recorded on wednesday in atlanta as cm punk and he was part of the privy in conversations they've engaged regularly since their small little thing in the summer they've been on the same show the same locker rooms nothing's been brought up since that one tiff in the summer jack perry's uh waited for weeks and weeks to find out to make a statement on air at the biggest show in AEW history to have a shot at somebody on camera. That This is just speaking factually. Uh, he's then bragged about it to his co-workers. He's then got out of his way to tell members of the media who are leaning towards, uh, who are more sympathetic to his cause than the perceived cause of CM Punk. That is also a fact. Then he does a song and dance, like see that real glass. Now that may seem like something small to you, but like if it's something that's a big issue internally in a dressing room, essentially what it is, like it'd be, it's just having a go at somebody trying to mock them on camera in front of the whole world. And like, you can, a lot of people would let that go. Um, in modern world, a lot of people would let that go. In previous generations, that'd be somebody that does the during camera, you get met at the curtain and you get in a fight. That is, I think Arrow would, would have been dealt with in the locker room. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, do you know what I mean? That's, that's spot on. Like, that would have been, in previous generations, that's the norm. You can call it toxic, you can call it whatever. I'm just speaking, that's what would have happened. And a lot of the talking heads who particularly don't like CM Punk, really don't like him, be it Road Dog, Eric Bischoff, a number of other people fully agree with that. Like, a fight was probably the likely outcome, and that would have happened in previous generations. Um, like There's famous stories of CM Punk and others getting in, and The Undertaker, for one, had a big, massive brawl in WWE because uh, they had ongoing issues. Went into room... CM Punk probably got beaten up and then they shook hands and that was the end of it um, 
So, yeah, CM Punk came backstage. Jack Perry shouldered him. Jack, CM Punk shoved him. Do we have a problem? Um, he says, no, I'm... He then kind of backtracked after shouldering him, saying, no, I was playing up to whatever. Dirt sheets are getting heel heat. And then CM yeah. Punk says, you know, I can fuck you up. And they shoulders... The, CM, Jack Perry tries to walk around and shoulders him again. CM Punk grabs him, puts him in some sort of choke. And then it all gets kind of broken up and squirmished. Tempers are raised, and CM Punk is kind of a bit rabid then, as the story goes. Yeah. And he's, he's getting dragged away. Fuck this, I quit. Fuck, fuck the lot of you. Um, which, if you know the background of a lot of stories, if you, if you feel like everybody in a room is out to get you and there's nothing you can do wrong, particularly if that's playing in your own head, it's not the most irrational thing in the world. If you think, like particularly if he'll probably feel he can't do any right and to an extent he couldn't do any right um by his own making um if you feel like there's a if you feel in your head that there's a coercive effort against you to kind of get you to feel isolated and out of a company these things happen as well so or that could happen as well so um yeah and then he Samoa Joe calmed him down and got him to agree to the match. Jack Perry was immediately sent home from the building um, to the hotel. Uh, quite rightly so, for a premeditated antagonistic plot, essentially, and to brag about it beforehand. Um, CM Punk then went out and delivered a brilliantly entertaining, perfect card opener, uh, I thought. Came backstage, got in a huge row with Tony Khan. Um, at the Jack Perry piece, apparently he knocked over monitors and made a slight lunge towards Tony, but yeah, apparently yeah. It, was, it was after the match when they had a, a meeting in a room, and apparently mm. that was worse. So um, he was obviously wound up and threatened to batter his boss, probably. Yeah. Um, which is, yeah. Supposedly, as well, that the, the, again, the, the, other, the other stories that have come out is that, like, that, that started beforehand as well, and that maybe threats were made beforehand before he went out for his match and just continued on afterwards yeah so anyway so he's um yeah he's you he can't threaten your boss yeah. physically or mentally so um yeah that's reason enough to get terminated so following that went back to his locker room um house of black were there perez another piece i released so house of black perez hobbs were all there and they said fuck this anybody's got a problem with you let's go beat the piss out of them which is quite admirable if you think standing up for your mates whether they've done right or wrong um this type of mate i want to have um yeah. somebody's got your back so fair play to them um brody king um broke his hand then <laughs> punching a wall um silly. in anger it's very silly I've a, I have a friend who did that it's just a silly silly thing to I've, do I've, I've, I've done a lot of stupid <laughs> stuff as well so uh listen to who am i to judge um cm punk then said to everybody listen i think it'd be better if i go now um obviously he was quite emotional was crying in the locker room about it um so he left then he went back to the hotel uh ordered a shit ton of nandos um for himself house black paris hobbs ftr and other people and uh, they had like a private thing in the hotel in one of the function rooms on the fourth floor in the hilton um just lads being just like mates being mates were mm-hmm. reflecting on the show and stuff because for other people everybody else in the show it was a big moment and it was a huge success um yeah. So the, and then it all blew over, and I think the I think CM Punk afterwards was kind of knew himself. It was probably everything was probably over. Um, he was quite depressed for a long time. For the week following, he uh, went to the Cauliflower Alley Club. He got presented with their higher highest award, which is like it's the Wrestlers Wrestler Hall of Fame Cauliflower mm-hmm. Alley Club. Uh, and he had a really grateful uh, speech. A lot of really. Um, anecdotes about kind of senior wrestlers and what they've done for him and how much they mean to him be it Hardy Brace, JBL and Mickey James and more um, throughout his career um, speaking to, he said speaking to a few people who were close to his camp um, they always said that like he wants he wanted to come back at that point but he was kind of like resigned to the fact that it's probably not going to happen now um, and there's all sorts of um Meltzer speculation out there now that uh, CM Punk's going to come back with this big legal lawsuit that's going to blow up and everybody's going to go nuts. There's nothing going to happen now. He wants to give off the impression that things are... He's not a crazy person, mm-hmm. um, that he's not a lunatic. And, um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you see him in the Royal Rumble. I just hope he doesn't... Jeez, uh... oh, I wouldn't put me put it past it. But the rumors out there is that he's looking for a podcast. Um who's who's gonna put him up this time and um, because we know what happened after the WWE stuff and I just think um yeah 
I think hopefully he's he's in a good place mentally, um, mm-hmm. and he can kind of like maybe just like let this one lie, like and just leave it, leave it alone and like. Yeah, he is. Yeah. So you're not going to see or hear from him in any dirt sheets or newsletters, yeah. other than speculation, pure speculation for yeah. a number of months. <laughs> Yeah, um, obviously a lot, a lot in there, Mark, um, and a lot going on. And um, just a very, very basic question: like, I, he probably, in my opinion, he shouldn't have been there at, at all. In and anyway, I think that the writing should have been on the wall before that uh, for Punk. Um, I think that's arguably the case. Um, I think you, you did mention that, like, you you do stuff with your boss, or you, you lunge towards your boss, make threats towards your boss, stuff like that. Um, I think the writing is is firmly on the wall, and um, it's it's just sad that the the two the two big instances that happened happened off the back of two massive shows, you know, like you had the the brawl out incident after what was a massive show, um, and now here their biggest show eighty one thousand people Wembley Arena, you know, or Wembley Stadium, it's huge. It's the biggest show um in the world. Um, biggest show in Europe ever and like arguably depending if inside or outside North Korea but um, yeah just it's just a shame that the, the the talk coming out of it was this you know and not how good the show was but let's finish on a high note I was just going to add to that before you do Yeah. coming out, out of the show the talk was the show the day after yeah. the talk was the show the Tuesday most of Tuesday the talk was the show but right Tuesday evening onwards I get it's the industry and I get that's what people do like we're talking about it now just for mm-hmm. text and stuff but that's, that's what you do they whip this into a frenzy so by the end of the week it was that only thing talking about it. whereas the atmosphere from about Tuesday evening onwards through this uh, collision that was all people could talk about they whipped it into a frenzy so it's 24-7 on every news channel up to that point everybody every fan online everybody who was in England everybody was high as a, cl- high as a kite going on about AEW all in but by Tuesday when by Wednesday it was at the back of people's mind which is an absolute shame and I think if you're people only talking about negativity in the wrestling media space and highlighting negativity you should probably have a look at yourself yeah um but yeah I was going to say we, we'll finish on a high note um all in does return next year 25th of August uh, mm-hmm. 2024 which is the Sunday again um, I've already kind of semi booked a few things um, I'll be there the, the, it was in my opinion for me one of the best weekends best weeks of my life um, mm-hmm. I know you've said said as much and um, outside of just all in the, the other wrestling shows that are on the buzz that's around it everything all encompassing um, just made it such such a great week and such mm-hmm. such a such a great place to be and um, I'll definitely be back. I know you said that you would be back as well, and like I think we can both encourage people to to take the trip over next year. Um, yeah. whether they'll get eighty one thousand next year is is gonna be, um, something I, to see. I think they'll easily do forty fifty. I think they'll I think they'll pass it next year. I think this this is the first one. So if you look at like an, a WrestleMania, like this is first one logistics, travel, getting vendors. This is a first time exploratory show. And the buzz that's created be around the progress, rep pro and everything. They're like, oh, let's take a chance on this. Yeah. There's going to be an expectation now next year where it's like a almost a WrestleMania type event. Um, and I think, let's be honest, there's a black cloud gone from AEW. And I'm not calling CM Punk a black cloud. I think the tension mm-hmm. you've, is gone. I think that reflected on this week's programming. I think there was a significantly more focused program this week as well. And I think you're going to see that over the five hours of television they have per week. And I think with talent they've re-signed I think there's a lot of people that are going to be pulling up their boots and making more of a concerted effort in certain things I think by this time next year I think um, people are going to be getting their AEW all-in tickets significantly earlier I think there'll be 50 60,000 tickets gone very quickly and I think they only got that last 20 30,000 very very late mm-hmm. they had they sold 7,000 tickets in the last four days before yeah. all-in so if you've got that anticipation that build and they'll grow their partnership with ITV and there'll be better marketing, better money coming through from their television deals and things. So I'm very, very excited for it. I think next year, maybe the following year might be a drop off, but I think just from this year alone, I think there'll be excitement levels will be and expectation levels will be significantly raised. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
but yeah um we'll be there in any way and hopefully everyone else will will do the same and get theirs get their tickets asap um or whenever they go on sale sign up to the pre-codes are already on are already available to sign up that you get the the notices as soon as possible but um yeah we'll leave it at that we have more to come we will be talking about the other shows ott and stuff as well um but yeah thanks very much for joining myself and mark on this one and we'll see you on the next one all the best.